All good? Okay, right. Morning all, my name's Alan Walker. I work for Airtight Networks as the technical manager based in the UK. I know it's vendor neutral, vendor agnostic, so I'm going to try and steer clear of, of what Airtight actually does. Um, I will be showing you a couple of tools, so as we look at it, we'll have a, a brief look at the planner output and also WizShark, which we've actually used on a, a project that we're, I'm going to be talking about. So this talk is going to be based on a project which we've done recently, um, the, the kind of best practices. It's not Airtight's best, best practices, it's mine that I've used throughout the, the, the years of doing it. And it seems that most other people sitting over the last day uh, have also come up with very similar things as well, so it's not like I'm reinventing the wheel. But we'll have a look at some of the issues, um, what we've done, how we've done it. So we're going to cover the deployment details, so the details of the deployment. What, what was it we actually put in, how large was it, where was it, and how we did it. Uh, best practices and mistakes to avoid. So things that uh, we've seen along the way that we come across, and I'm sure all of you have as well. So uh, you will get them. Then we'll have a look at the planning tool, just about the surveys or the designs, if you want to call them that, and obviously into troubleshooting. And it's jumping on. So the de deployment details, 1,200 locations across five continents. This was one network. So it, it was how we had to get it over. Um, there were 4,400 plus access points in the network. So they're, they're, the client wanted to be able to control these, obviously, from one area. We came across different wireless vendors. So we got the incumbent there. And we've got to then install and make work as well, whilst they're still using their existing network, whether we're going to be for security, because um, we do that on top of the wireless. But we was going in as wireless, and uh, a rip and replace was not what was happening. It was working with them. And obviously, several LAN vendors. So will it work with HP, Cisco? Um, I'm sure you've come across that. What, what needs to be done? So as we go in. Info gathering. So to start off with on any project, you need to get the info gathering. What are the requirements, the business needs of the customer? So again, this comes down to the surveys of uh, the information you send out to get back before you go down to site. So you've got the, the business requirements of who needs it, where they actually need it in their building, what they need. Do they want voice quality or do they want data? The last thing you want to do is start deploying for a voice network throughout. If they're not actually going to use it, they're going to do hand scanners in a warehouse. Are you actually going to want voice there? Um, I'm sure sales will say, yes, let's put voice there, but you know you don't actually need it. So you have to take that into account. So the profiling, um, as we've got here, categorize the profiles and build the SLAs for that. So this is all, all at the beginning on the info. So where do you need it? What do you need? What are you going to be putting across it? What applications are you using? Are you going to be using sensitive, uh, lag-sensitive applications, uh, 50 milliseconds? You know, it's, uh, if, if you're going to roam, is it going to handle it? Is it going to break? Is it one of those good old databases? Is it going to cause you issues? So profile them and give them SLAs. So that you can say, right, OK, so we need to make sure we have RSSI of NEG67, uh, latency of, of under 50 milliseconds if you're going to be doing it. On a greenfield site, um, as has been mentioned several times over the last day or so, it's yes, it could be greenfield, but if you're in a block, you could have a shop at the bottom or offices, and then you've got apartments at the top. So it might be totally empty, but is it empty above and below? So try and baseline what's there, because there's nothing worse than getting all this information, building your network, designing it, putting it in, and it doesn't work. And as they were saying yesterday with the beam that came in and hit the corner of the building, nobody knew. It was a new building. They put it in, but they didn't check it before it went in. So that goes on to the mistakes, ignoring the needs of the business. So, OK, so you design a network, you put it in, laptops. We're going to do data. I mean, I used to work for a company uh, a few years back, that we would do surveys for data and we would do separate ones if it was voice or mobile devices. Obviously now everybody is mobile, but if you ignore the needs of what they're going to be doing, try and find out, speak to the business units. What are you going to be doing in a year, in two years? Because hopefully they're not going to be replacing the equipment. But don't ignore them, listen to them, and then design the network accordingly. Make sure that that is in place. And the good old-fashioned new hardware will not solve all your issues. Don't just buy AC because it's available. It's, uh, as, as we saw, the 5 gig spectrum is pretty much empty. 2.4 is swamped, is going to be for a long time. But 5 gig people are not using it, but they're all jumping to AC because marketing and sales, they're, they're pushing that. So you need to look at that as we're doing it. Um, so don't ignore it is the main point from there. Into the analysis, the, the, the actual design of the network. So once you're out doing your survey, Active or passive? Yes, great. Active is, is by far the best, but have you got the time to do it? Is it going to be cost? Um, can you actually 
afford to send an engineer out for two weeks at a time to do a, uh, a 500 AP install. So you need to look at that. The channels. So when you're out there doing it, make sure you plan it. So, so you're doing your survey, see what you've got. 2.4 there, less is more. It is. So if you, if you have 20 APs and you put 20 2.4 channels in, yeah, you're going to get problems. And we've got some examples as, uh, as we, we, we move through. So survey it, see what's there, active or passive. Brilliant. Categorise all your clients. Find out what you've got. If it's a greenfield site, it's not so much of a problem. But list the, the, the clients of what you've got, the bands. Is it mobiles? Is it phones? Is it laptops? Are you getting MacBooks? Do you want to go three by three? Are you just going to go single stream? And retire the old client. So this is stuff that you've all heard um, from yesterday, and I'm not sure what was on today over the road. But it's get rid of B if you can. If not, remove the data rates. If you can get rid of G, great. If not, there's a lot of BGN clients out there. So look to remove the old, the old, old legacy clients. And the mistakes that we, we've seen here. So 40 megahertz, I want it because my AP supports it. It's great if it supports it, but why use it? You really don't need it. And one SSID with all the clients. You don't want all your clients on one SSID because, again, you've got your B, your G, your N. So if you can't get rid of the B because they might have them, try and separate them via SSID. Keep them separate as you're doing it. And from the survey, the, the neighbour channels and the crowded channels. Now, as uh, the next couple of slides that I've got here, it's um, uh, I was doing a report for a client who had some 2.4 issues. And he was complaining he had uh, four sensors, four APs actually in there, and he couldn't use his network. And it's because they had lots of neighbour channels, didn't realise, put the networks in. Being too lazy to complete it, it's, uh, I've worked with many engineers who will walk in, do a couple of points, and then walk out and think, yeah, that's it, the whole building's done, that's good, I'm just going to replicate it and roll it out. It's, if you're going to do an active survey, do an active. If you're going to do a predictive with some measurement checks, then yeah, brilliant. Go to site, spot check it, check it against your predictive. If you're seeing neg 70 on the predictive and neg 75 on the, the survey, you've got an issue. So it's, it's too high anyway, but you, you need to just go and actually check. So, and here was a, a snapshot, I was just, just literally sitting down, just, just over in the corner there, and just ran this up on the Mac just to see what was going on. Prime example, so channel three. 2.4, channel 3, as you know, 1.6 and 11. It's, uh, I know that was a, a high network, but I was just looking just to see what was going on there. So, And you've still got the, the data rates in there. So if you can remove them, get them out. Remove the old clients and try not to put networks in on channel 3. You know, you, you've got 1.6 and 11. And I know we've got 13 over in Europe. Uh, the Americans haven't. So if you're doing a deployment with American counterparts, be careful. If you deploy on 13 and they come over, they may not work. Yes, it'd be good and funny, but... So here was the, the, the one I was talking about. This was a, a client who's got a 2.4 network, and they've got some issues. And I just did, literally just uh, ran a report from there. And the noisy channels, they had 81 noisy channels. So again, yesterday we had a look and saw the 5 gig and the 2.4. And the networks on 1.6 and 11 was 1,098 within those four APs. That's what they could see. And they were having problems getting on 2.4. Now, they, they didn't understand why, but it's, uh, we, we delved in, had a look at the report. So we, Airtype didn't install it. It was uh, a network that was just put in. And again, it's going in. We find the mistakes and then try and solve them. So it's a 2.4 only. So when we had a look, this was the main problem. Virgin Trains Wi-Fi, 404 networks. So they're right by our railway. So every time a train goes past, they've got Wi-Fi on. It's interfering with theirs. It's, it was a very strong signal. But then the one thing that was funny was this one. There's no SSID, so apparently it wasn't a problem because it wasn't being broadcast. It's, you know, it's still in the air, it just didn't have the name being broadcast, but they thought it wasn't an issue. So it's, it's just things, mistakes like this that we see. So try to avoid them and, and educate the people as you go through. Because you will get this, lots of networks. So 1, 6 and 11, and that was the networks in use. So once you, you've got your details of the sites, you're looking at what's going on, you know what you're surveying for, you've created your usage profiles, it's time to decide what you're going to do. So, you've got 1,200 sites, are you going to go for an active survey? Are you really going to send an engineer out to 1,200 sites? Probably not. 
So you can survey a couple, do a predictive, get a baseline of what they've got, what the buildings are. You need to find out the information on the buildings and put it into a planning planning tool. Any planning tool, I know we, they were doing Echo yesterday, we've got our RF planner. <coughs> so we can import the plans into it. And then you can either manually put the wall information in and the RF loss throughout, or take CAD and then you, you've got a lot of it in there. So put it in and then have a cookie cutter approach. So literally you can stamp it out across. And then yes, you can send someone out to the odd site. You can even phone someone up if they've got a tech team, give them a, um, a device, say, right, just go and check the signal. You've got several free tools insider from Metagate yesterday. So you've got one for the Mac that you can just download. But you can just check the signal level and just see. Make sure that you're doing it right because you don't want to get 1,200 sites wrong. So I was just saying any predictive tool can be used. So we've got one here that we're going to look at just from the RF planner from, uh, from our company of, of what we use. So plan in, you've seen all these plans, we've seen a lot of them over the last couple of days. The first thing you're going to get out of it is the RSSI. Everybody loves to see that lovely colourful map. Oh, it's all green, it's great. But you know, put one AP in and you can make it look green everywhere. It's, it's not really what you want it's, if you've got the coverage. So the, the colour's a bit out now. It's, you can change the colour scales, but obviously the darker colour is good. So we've got four APs in there. Everything looks good. Brilliant. So you can pack up your tools and go, go away. But then you've got to check out the channels as well, obviously. So here we've got the 2.4 and the 5. Separation on the 5, no problem. 2.4, three channels, 1, 6 and 11. Yes, we're at, this, this client has got sites across five continents. So we've got the Americas and we've got Europe as well um, in EMEA. But we don't have 13. We could have 1, 1 6, 11, 13. Americans, we can't. So, with the planning tool, we can also get the redundancy link speed channel interference. You need this, the noise, what's going on, what interference have you got? So this was the requirements for this project, and they wanted this for 1,200 sites before we started rolling it out. So we had to then come up and do this. So we couldn't send someone out, we couldn't expect the reseller to send someone out, so we had to literally do the cookie cutter. We went to a couple of sites, checked it, found out the details, got it in. Once we have the info gathering, we know what they're going to be using it for. And they were using it for guest, corporate, and mobile devices. So the redundancy. Now here you can see one, one signal, two signals. So two, two radios are going to cover it. And then in the centre, you've obviously got a few more. So that's the redundancy should one of them die. Now this is what the client wanted. Uh, they had to have this information. And link speed. So it's yes, it's a guesstimate. It's a best guess effort from a planning tool, and that's what it is at the end of the day, because you haven't gone out, you haven't done an active survey for a, a data transfer. Obviously, it's the best way to do it. But this was just the information we had to build together. And channel interference. Now, five gig, fantastic, nothing. 2.4, obviously, we're going to get some because we've got three channels in there, they're near each other, but we've got two of the same channel. So we have some interference. Now, this is what you should be looking at, if you're doing predictive surveys, is produce this. I know, I know a lot of people literally just produce the heat map coverage, send it to the client. You need 22 APs and then walk away. But the trouble is, is if when you as the engineer, when you're going in, as you know, you can get the issues. So once we do, we, we've got the, the predictive done, so we've got the information, we know where they're going to use it, we know what channels we're looking at, we know what bands the clients are, we've got the baseline, we can look at the rest, so the cost of you know, how, I know uh, on the technical side, you're not too interested in the cost. You don't design a network to a budget. You design the network and then to, to the needs, and then they can argue the budget. But educate the client. So this is, this is a good one. Uh, we see this a lot. They get the phone out. They connect. I can't see Google. I can't get to the internet. The Wi-Fi is not working. And it's not just iPhones. It's, it's any phone. The smart device, they connect on, and they can't get there. So educate them on how they should be connecting. What should they be doing? Is the network set up? The bandwidth requirements, obviously, on the network, and we've heard about that, the backhaul, the internet, it's all very well giving two meg per client, but if you've got a two meg internet pipe, it's, it's not going to do it for 300 users. Um, we, we was looking at a, a local client, um, a nice little hospitality, and he, he wanted to give guest access. So fine, give guest access, it will work brilliantly. It doesn't matter which vendor it is, put it in there. But they literally had a DSL connection with a 256K up, and that was an issue. And that's because they were very, very remote and they didn't think of that before they actually implemented the network. So when people are trying to connect and they're authenticating through, 
up, up for the social, it was an issue. And of course, what got the blame? The Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi was the issue when it wasn't. It was actually on their network. So bear that in mind. The ugly factor. We come across this a lot as well. It's I don't want that AP there, uh, as Keith mentioned yesterday. Um, I, I don't want it there. I want it above. I want it hidden. But you've got ceiling furniture around. You go in most places, you'll see ceiling furniture there. Yes, it might not be the prettiest, but it's, it's an access point. It's in there. It's doing what it does. And we've, I've come across on many vendors. They want to hide it. They want to try and put it away somewhere. So you do the survey. It's brilliant. And then they, when it comes to the install, they hide it inside the just above the ceiling tiles. And then they complain it's not working. And you go back and it's, well, you, you put it above the tiles. But you said it was going to go there. So that's the problem, the ugly factor. Post-survey or verification survey, however you would like to name it or call it. If you can do it, brilliant, do it. Because then you can verify your work. You can verify what, what actually went on. Was it correct? Did it work? Is it going to work? So from usage profiles and the SLAs at the front, you might have said, oh, we're going to make sure that you're going to get three meg per client. So you can actually check it, do that, that transfer. And there was a couple of tools that we've been provided and uh, that you've, you've got already that you can actually run those and see. Not just RSSI. Mistakes. Don't install an AP every 300 feet. It's the, the last presentation. Uh, uh, he was talking about it. Apparently someone was putting an AP in and getting a compass and drawing a circle around it and saying, there's your coverage. And that's how they were doing it. And they were basing their survey on that. Not a good idea. So don't just install one that, yes, oh, it'll cover 300 feet. Brilliant. So let's just put one every 300 feet. It's not. Don't do that. Um, sales guys will do that. They'll walk their finger in the air. Oh, yeah, okay, we'll put one there, put one over there. Don't do it. Rip and replace, it's easy. Let's just do that. You might have Cisco and replace it with Aruba. Um, yeah, okay, so we'll just take it down. But not, not all APs are the same. I know they're very similar, but you're going to get some differences. And I know there was, uh, there's lots of information out there on the antenna patterns. So check if you're going to put it in. Is it going to be the same model, the same hardware? 2x2, two 3x3. Two, three three. And ignoring the future of the mobile market, the Internet of Things. I didn't want to put IoT, but... Um, uh, our marketing will love it, but the Internet of Things is, is obviously it's, it's coming if it's not already here. There's so much wireless devices out there. So what is going to be used? It's, are, are you going to plan for 20 or 40 megahertz moving forward? At the moment, try and stick with 20. There's no point in going 40 unless you're in an environment that everybody's going to bond and benefit from it, and you've got enough channels. So keep that in mind. Then post-install. So you've installed your network, it's gone in, but how do you troubleshoot it across 1,200 sites? This is what we was coming up with. The resellers were great. It was uh, pan-European, American, so that they had feet on the ground. But if you're doing troubleshooting, because uh, as soon as Wi-Fi goes in, as we're saying, uh, they're getting on the phones, it's not working. But is it not working? So you need to look at details of how you're going to get people to site to check. So how can you do it? So remote is obviously the, the, the best way. And this is one of the tools that um, we're just going to have a look at here. So we're going to have a, a quick flick through. It's not uh, a vendor presentation. So, but uh, I cannot connect to Google. Wi-Fi is not working again. So you know, it's always the it's the Wi-Fi went in. It must be the Wi-Fi's fault. So here we go. Device logging onto the Windows. I'm sure you've come across this, and we've actually got a, a workflow that we did looking at a client that was saying, well, I, I'm, I'm not logging on. I'm using Windows, I'm authenticating, but I'm not getting on, so it's, it's a Wi-Fi problem. So is it. Packet capture tools, it's, you, you've all got them, and you've also got one inbuilt on the Mac, so um, I don't know if you know that, but if you, if you don't, you can just literally go into the, the wireless, pick up the, the packet trace, run the packet trace on the network you're on. So you grab that, troubleshoot it, see what's happening, find out, where that client is and connect. So if you've got someone on site that can do this, brilliant. If you've got some Macs on site with some friendly IT staff, use them. Try not to travel to you know six different countries in three days just to do it. I know some of you uh, probably do it regularly. So from the Mac, it's, uh, I was running one. So you can just run a trace here, capture the information that's going through. And obviously, you can, it comes out as a WCAP, but I just rename it to PCAP and then drag it into this tool. It does work. You don't have to open it up in Wireshark, otherwise there's no point in doing a capture on the Mac. But um, just literally, it can be dragged into our dashboard. 
for this tool. This tool is not just airtight, it works with any vendor. So it's, it's just in the cloud, it's handy for remote troubleshooting if you want to go to remote geographies and you don't want to travel there. So you can actually grab captures from anybody on site and import them in, it'll work with any tool as well. So uh, that's why I've tried to hide all the names on here. So once we drag that capture in, whatever it is, OmniPeak, uh, uh, from the Mac as well, so Wireshark, we can pull it in and then you'll be familiar with the, the, the sort of pages that you can see. So here you can then have a look for the client. So the client who's not connecting. So we can sort in there, get the disassociation frames and have a look. Find that client, click on it. Why is that client being disassociated? So find the client, select it, and then we can literally visualize the packet trace. So this isn't the packet trace to that client. This was just to show you on the left here. So um, we're going to look at the packet trace for the client that's actually been disconnected. Why is it being disconnected when it's authenticating through AD? So on here, this is a, a tool to visualize the packet. So you still need to understand how a packet works and how the packet communication works. It's not going to tell you that, but it gives you visual trends. So it'll, it'll enable you or someone very, very quickly to do it. So you can run the capture, and the good thing is you can share it off. So we was having cl the client as well as the partners in the sites do this. So they, they were running this tool. They were having a look at the captures, but then they were able to share it. So they can actually share the link. So the top right, you can share it. Send this link and make it available. So with that tick, you can send it to your support department. Um, someone else, you can even send it through to Keith Parsons. He doesn't need access to this tool, but as soon as you email it out, you can then actually get on and have a look at the trace. And then they can see what you're seeing, what the client's seeing. So, and from the bottom, this is where we work up. So you, you get the details of the frame. So it's, it's trying to visualize. So you can click on this at any time and delve right into the actual packet trace and see uh, the, the complete trace. So it'll visualize it. So that's just what the dot is. That's just where it's the, the, the data communication. So here was the trace of the client that wasn't connecting. So this is what we were trying to fix. And of course, it was the Wi-Fi's fault. Uh, they're, they're fine. They plug in the ethernet. It works. They go on the wireless. It doesn't work. So this is just to visualize it as we're coming through. So we've got two nice big red blocks there. That indicates a failure. So straight away, it's easy to visualize. So even the, the first line support staff of a client can see there's an issue. So they can get it. Or you as the engineers can just say, OK, let's have a look. So what's going on? So two failures. So then let's have a look at the failures. So you can see here, transmitting. So it's a frame coming. And then this is the failure indicator coming back. So from the client to the AP, and then the reply. So you can see here it's an EAP failure. So it'll just give you the, the EAP receive coming in. So why did it fail? So this is what we have to find out. And we do see this on several sites. I don't know if you guys get it as well. But we can zoom in. So you can zoom in at the top. As you can see, it's like a, a section. I don't have the mouse here. But you can zoom in and see the actual trace of the failures. And then you can follow it through, and you can visualize it. So here, layer 2 auth, as we see in the packet. So you can see it and visualize it as it's coming through. Into the association. So you can see the client authorizing, being associated, and then the EAP starts. So the identity request going through, so we're coming up to the failure. and then the response back. So within this packet, so you can see what, what's going on. The type, and here we are here. So transmit, it's the response packet for identity, and then you get the identity within the packet. So it's a host. So you can see it as the host packet coming through. And this was where the problem was. This is what it was failing on. So it's the client, puts it in as a host. So it actually tells you it's a host, Authentication, machine authentication, and not user. That was the problem. So if you can change it to the user, and you can do that on the client. And the eat failure frame was coming up because it was trying to authenticate the machine, and they were, they, they, were, they were set up for user authentication. So that's why we actually failed. And you can see that literally just very quickly following through. So it'll give you the details. So the, the, the reason that particular client was failing was 
the authentication set on the client. So we had to change the client. Now this is a typical example of what we're seeing coming from clients. Um, you're going out there installing the network, you've got the network in there, you've planned it, you've put your 2.4 and your 5 gigahertz, and you know uh, you get the interference. So we use the, the, the Wiz Shark to actually troubleshoot that, and it saves us going on site, because 1,200 sites is a lot. So that's a very, very quick way of looking at uh, what's going on. Now, I don't want to harp on too much about the surveys, because I know we've, we've covered that on three or four different presentations. You're probably all bored of it. Unfortunately, it's uh, um, on the second day. That, that's, you know, you get stuck with me. So is there any questions on anything? Are you all happy with? Yeah? So that is where I'm actually going to turn off then because it's, uh, um, I, I was told to keep it short as we started late. But it's, it's basically my views on planning. Info gathering is important, so the key takeaways on that. Make sure you get the information. You cannot beat it. Get the information from the clients. Get the stakeholder input. Do not just send off a spreadsheet. You don't get any response back. Chase it up. Get that information, because you're going to need it for the survey, whether that's predictive or active. If it's active, Excellent, you're going to get accurate information. If it's predictive, do not ignore the fact of how the building is made up, the information that you're going to require to actually check that, because it's, it's just going to come back and bite you later on. I'm sure there's networks that you've done that, um, as you were learning, you know, yeah, yeah, I'll just uh, I'll cut corners and, you know, you make mistakes, but you learn from those mistakes, and hopefully you don't make them anymore. Moving on. Everybody's very quiet. No abuse. Thank you.